Well, good morning once again. <clears throat> Wonderful to see you. It's uh, been a great service. Uh, always baptism is so exciting. A uh, uh, wonderful service to have. Great spiritual energy. And I'm glad that we can be together to witness that. And wonderful music. It's wonderful to all be together worshiping this morning. So we thank the Lord for all of those good gifts. And we come now to... Uh, share just a little bit of God's Word for us today, to learn from what God wants us to know. What we have been preaching on in the uh, 9.30 and the 11 o'clock services these last few weeks are the disciplines of the disciple. What disciplines do the followers of Jesus, those that have believed in him, that have gone through the waters of baptism, what disciplines do they need do we need, do I need, to make Christ the Lord of my life, to get all that I can out of this Christian walk, to, to be about who and what Jesus wants me to be. And so we've talked about the disciplines. The first is to make Christ the center of your life. Let him, all that you do, revolve around him. We talked about the discipline of living in the Word of God, not just reading the Bible, but living it out in our daily walk. About praying in faith, not just the maybe rote, memorized prayer that you pray in the evening meal or before you go to bed, but really praying in faith and trust in God that He loves you and cares for you and will answer your prayers according to His will. We talked about ministering to others that a disciple of Christ just can't uh, grow in him uh, without being concerned and having a love for other people and reaching out to those who are less fortunate than we, than we the poor, uh, the sick, uh, those like we saw in our videos who, who really need Jesus. Now today we come to another discipline and this is the discipline of fellowshipping with other believers, of fellowshipping with other Christians. And some may be saying to yourself, why is that a needed discipline of the disciple? How does, does hanging around other Christians help me grow in Jesus Christ? Or maybe fellowship to you means when we gather down in the uh, fellowship hall and eat. You know, we're, we're good about Baptist about that. We love to eat. But, you know, fellowship is deeper than that. It's more than that. And although we ask those questions, we know that, that Scripture teaches us that being in an ongoing fellowship with other believers, of other brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, is vital to making Jesus the Lord of our life. And you know, once Christ is the Lord of our life, the other pieces of the puzzle fall into place. They make more sense in life. Life has meaning in all the areas that we love. In fact, I go as far to say that a believer in Jesus can not be a balanced disciple, yet neglect the loving relationship with other people. Christianity is not meant to be lived out alone. We witnessed the beautiful symbol of baptism this morning. Not only does baptism reveal that a person personally has accepted the grace of God, it also means that, that Mark and Mary have been baptized into the life of believers at Fairview, doesn't it? It means that, that they see the importance of not walking this journey by themselves, that they need, and you and I need, to surround ourselves with others who believe in Jesus. Paul said in one of his letters that all members, all believers, are of one and share one baptism. And I think that's what he's talking about. We come together, we're baptized into this life together. So let's take a look this morning at what Scripture says concerning the importance of being in fellowship with one another and, and how fellowship aids us in our growth 
in Jesus and also advances the kingdom of God. The first thing I would say about fellowship is that Jesus says that loving one another and the fellowship of believers is the distinctive characteristic of his disciples. That's what he chose to point out. The Gospel of John, the 13th chapter, verse 34 and 35, Jesus says this. He says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. In other words, Jesus says that the identifying mark to the rest of the world and for the world to know that you are his disciples is if you have love for each other and if you have love for others. Out of all the ways that we today choose to think that we as Christians stand out as witnesses for Christ, of all the ways that, that we choose to stand out to our world, that loving one another is greater than, than trying to be and say we're more moral than anyone else. It's more powerful than public protest. It's more powerful than judging others that we're better than them. It's more powerful than being self-righteous. It's more powerful than cold door evangelism, just going up and knocking on the door and sharing our faith. Jesus says, no, the greatest thing you can do to share with others and have them interested in Jesus Christ to become their Savior is to love each other. We need to listen to that, don't we? That's amazing. That is amazing. Loving others and, and being able to remain in harmonious fellowship shows that, that you are seriously attempting to make Jesus the Lord of your life. You know, I, I, I've shared several illustrations about my dad. He was a great influence on me. And... One of the things I remember about my dad's walk, his life, he came to Jesus late, probably in his late 30s or around 40, but he just exuded a love and a concern for other people. That was just a part of who he grew into as a man that followed Jesus Christ. And you know, the times that I can remember as a boy and a teenager, many members of our church and even some of our non-Christian neighbors would call him and would come over to him simply to want to share with him their problems. To simply ask him, even though they did not know and pray regularly, to pray for them, pray for them. I remember our very next door neighbor, didn't go to church a lot, but he came over and he and his wife were having very difficult marital problems. And he came over and I was just out working in the yard with my dad and I remember him saying, you know, Mr. George, he said, um, I, you know, I know we don't talk a lot about this, but he says, I, I know you go to church a lot and uh, I, I wonder if you could listen, I wonder if you could help me. My marriage is breaking up. Because somehow he knew I don't know, somehow my dad exuded this love for other people. Jesus says that you, the people will know you're my disciples if you love each other. He was a simple man, my dad, an insurance agent. But when he died, I, I stood in the receiving line at the funeral home for hours and hours and hours as person after person came through to thank me for how he had made a difference in their lives. People I didn't even know. Uh, that is the power of loving fellowship and what Jesus is talking about. Another thing I'd say about fellowshipping with believers as it helps us to, uh, to grow in Christ is that 
fellowshipping with believers means loving us falling in love with worshiping together as church every week. That's what the Bible says about fellowship as well. Hebrews says this in chapter 10. It says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The discipline of learning to have loving relationships with other people begins where we, where we get how to do that often is by coming together every Sunday and worshiping our great God together. Hebrews says, in fact, that, that verse says that as we meet together for worship, we spur one another on towards love. We spur one another on towards good deeds. It's almost like we're accountable to each other. It's almost as we, we gain strength from each other to go out and love in Jesus' name. The Bible encourages us not to give up meeting together, not to ever lower the priority of worship. We are not to make weekly worship an option amidst many choices in life but realize that the only choice we have as disciples, as growing disciples of Jesus, is to come and worship him with other believers on Sunday morning. Across our country, beloved, that's not happening nowadays, is it? I found some of these statistics online about church attendance. Uh, adults age 65 and up attend wor church worship at least once a week, only 24%. Age range of 50 to 64, attend worship at least once a week, 28%. Ages 30 to 49, attend worship once a week, 32% of the time. And Adults the ages of 18 and 29 attend church once a week about 17% of the time. Weekly worship attendance is declining in our country. There are just so many more choices for believers and non-believers to make on Sunday mornings. I realize that. I, we, we didn't play baseball on Sunday. We didn't have basketball tournaments on Sunday. We didn't have cheerleading camps on Sunday or dance on Sunday. I know that those choices are out there. But what I'm saying is, going back to Scripture, the Bible says if you want to make Christ Lord of your life, if you want to learn how to love others more consistently, if you want what's best for your life, is be in the house of worship on a Sunday morning. That will do more for you, more for your kids, than anything else that you can do. If your worship with you and your family is not a priority, then I would go as far to say you're not living the disciple life that Jesus has intended for you. Don't shoot me. I'm just a messenger. It is in worship that our love for God and each other grows. Worship is where we rejoice for each other, like we did today in baptism. Worship is where we weep with each other in our struggles. Worship is where we come and we're convicted with each other, and we repent with each other and are forgiven with each other. That's powerful stuff. 
It's through worship we, we come to realize each week that we need a Savior. We can't do this on our own. It's in worship that we discover we need each other. So I encourage you once again, if, if the priority of worshiping the Lord with other believers has waned, or you don't consider it a priority in life, it's one of many priorities, I ask you to pray to the Lord about it. I ask that you look into the Word of God and decide to commit on your own what is best for you and your spiritual health and how it will help the rest of your life. When all of this comes together, fellowshipping with other believers, fellowshipping with other believers blossoms into serving and caring for one another. That's why it's so important as a discipline of the Christian. It blossoms into something greater. First Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says this, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of of God's grace in its various forms. See, stewardship in the Bible means more than tithing your money. Now, don't stop doing that. No, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> but we're also to be stewards of the grace of God. We're to be stewards of the grace God's given us. We're not supposed to hoard it in here. We're supposed to share it with others. And when we begin to share the grace of God, it leads to serving others. The commitment and the desire to serve and the minister comes out of our deep fellowship and relationship we have with other believers. That's what Peter is saying, what Paul says. Fellowship with other believers leads to active ministry, to serving others in need, and to caring for everyone no matter who they are or their background. Fellowship teaches us humility. It teaches us empathy. It teaches us trust. It teaches us faith. One of the greatest gifts and rewards God has given me in my life as a Christian are the hundreds of Christian friends I have made in my life. That's got to be up near number one. My life story could be told by just recounting Christian friends I have now and have in the past. And I just love life. I just love the Christian life. And I love my Christian friends. Some I haven't seen since grade school and high school and college, but we still get together. We still talk, and now we have all the social media. We can do that more. But it's like we've never left each other. Yeah, we had deep friendships, but because of Jesus. Let me leave you with one question, always, and this is what I've lived with in my life, too. One marker of where you are in your Christian fellowship is to ask yourself this. And I relate this to the story. Remember the four friends? who brought their sick friend on a stretcher to Jesus and they went up on the roof because they couldn't get in and they tore a hole in the roof and let him down so Jesus could heal him. My question is, is do you have, right now, can you think of at least four Christian friends that you can call on at any time for any reason and without judgment, and they would drop everything and come running to help you. They would come running to listen to you. They would come running to pray for you. They would come running and do anything you needed because of your deep Christian fellowship. I'm blessed I have that. There's men I can call on, and they have and they will be there no matter what. And I will be there for them. Fellowshipping with others. Fellowshipping with others is a discipline 
of the disciple. It's a gauge of how close you are in your walk with Jesus. And I pray that that you have those kind of deep relationships of people who care for you that you'll never have any other gift on this side of heaven probably greater than that of having someone. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for saving us and thank you for not leaving us alone, Lord, that you give us each other And within each of us is a lot of you, your Holy Spirit. And Lord, help our fellowship with one another lead us to knowing you more deeply and to seeing how much we need you in our life. Thank you for this morning, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen.